Jesse for sharing such a great communion. I wasn't prepared to cry a little bit before coming up here, but you know. <laughs> so time where kids can go to kids class. Um, to the lesson. to follow my wife as well as the last time we were all together it was you know Easter Sunday talking about the resurrection kind of the the pinnacle point of Christianity so it's like all right I don't, I'm not quite sure how to start the task of following that up uh, but I feel like for me the my thought process was uh, the book of Acts because that's kind of what happens right after <laughs> Uh, right after the resurrection and right after Jesus reappears to the disciples. Uh, so I wanted to kind of start with a scripture out of Acts 1. But first, because I'm a little bit of a history nerd and I know there was something on the internet, you know, within the last couple of years talking about how guys always think about the Roman Empire, but I am kind of one of those, <laughs> one of those guys a little bit. I was a history minor in school. Uh, with the Bible, there's a lot of interaction with uh, with the Roman Empire, so it's something I probably think about more than most people. Uh, but I think it's pertinent to a story, something that I, I learned a couple of years ago and that I think about regularly this time of year, you know, around Easter and after Easter. Um, but kind of going back to, you know, the time of, of the Caesars, uh, the first Caesar being Julius Caesar, who, you know, obviously reigned, and then he was killed. So after he was killed, there was a little bit of a power struggle between Mark Antony, which was one of his generals, uh, and then his nephew slash adopted son, Octavian, who later is August, known as Augustus. Um, but they're kind of sharing the power to start with, uh, and then eventually, you know, Augustus comes to power. But one of, one of the ways that he did that, and one of the things that he did in that, was a few months after Caesar was killed, I thought about this too because of the eclipse. There was not, I don't have any eclipse references, but there, it's, there, it was another astrological phenomenon, if you will. So they were holding like a games in honor of Julius Caesar after his death. And then during that time period, there was a comet that's now known as Caesar's Comet. I think it may have been the most brightly seen comet you know, from Earth, you know, in history. And there's all kinds of people that wrote about it in that time period. But while they were honoring Caesar, this comet came about in the sky for several days. Uh, and, and one of the ways that uh, Octavian used this to his advantage was he, he came and he, he told this story. He said, this was, this comet was my father, you know, Julius ascending you know, to become a deity and, and to reign, you know, in the stars with the gods as kind of the, the god of gods. Uh, and since my father, you know, was a god, that makes me the son of God. I am kind of the, the god incarnate that is ruling, you know, on, on earth. So he came up with the story, but he still kind of needed the help of you know, the, the Roman Republic, the Roman Senate to, to kind of take power. They didn't really like Mark Anthony, who was a general. So they, they thought quickly on their feet with the story and they said, you know what, you're right. There, there were 12 senators who said, Julius Caesar appeared to us on a mountain and said, we're gonna, I'm giving my power and my authority to you guys to continue on in my kingdom and to take the, the glory and the reign of Rome to the ends of the earth. Uh, and this story kind of sounds familiar in a, in a church yeah. setting on a Sunday. Uh, I think there, there are so many ways that I think God twists and, and takes things that, that happened in the earth that the people there would be familiar with at the time and then makes them his own and, and makes them greater. But uh, just coming off of that 
background uh, is where I wanted to get into uh, Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know, that, that was, I think, Jesus' message was, you know, while he reigned, or while he was on earth, was, you know, always about the kingdom of God. You know, John came before him saying, hey, the kingdom of God is near, and then Jesus came and kind of said, hey, the kingdom of God is here. And, you know, he, he preached this to his disciples while, while he was alive, and I, I think they understood in part, but they, you know, I think they, much like we often do with God, we have expectations of the way God is going to do something. I think that even ties into, you know, uh, Jesse's communion about having a way that she was hoping that God would allow a moment to happen. Uh, but sometimes, it, you know, he does it in a way that we're not expecting. Um, and I think Jesus died and the disciples got discouraged and scattered a little bit because they thought, okay, you know, he's bringing that, that physical kingdom. He's going to overthrow Rome and we're going to be in glory and it's going to be great. Uh, but he comes back, he kind of gathers his disciples back to him and has to give them a little bit of a, a pep talk. He's like, no, I'm here, I'm alive, I can prove it. And now let me tell you some more about the kingdom of God. And he talks to them for, for 40 days, you know, about the kingdom of God. And that, that number of 40 days happens a lot of times throughout the Bible. You look at the flood, you look at you know, Jesus' temptation in the desert. Uh, Goliath is taunting the, the Israelite army for 40 days, you know, among numerous other examples. But that, that 40 days is usually brings out kind of a time of, of testing. And I think you know, that, that's what it, it was for you know, Jesus' disciples. I think they, they, were, they were now starting to get a, an understanding and a learning uh, about what, what the kingdom that Jesus was talking about really is about. Um, and I'm going to look at verse 6 to 9 here in that same passage in Acts 1. It says, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So I think this was a kind of a question that they asked him a lot of times while he was alive. Like, is this going to be the day that, like, the kingdom's going to be restored. And they didn't totally get it. And here, it seems like maybe they still didn't. You know, they, they bring it up again. Is this when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, but I heard kind of Marty Solomon from the Bama podcast talking about this, this scripture and this idea and coming at it from kind of a Jewish perspective and saying, you know what, here it actually seems like they do get it. That usually... A rabbi would, you know, if he's teaching his disciples, he wouldn't, you know, leave them until they understood the message. Uh, and so it seems like, you know, he's here, he's teaching them, he asked that question, but then Jesus, you know, immediately ascends into heaven. It seems like, okay, they've, they understand now, and, and I'm going to show them in this moment. And he's kind of saying, you know, you guys are going to be the ones that are going to take my message, just like... <clears throat> Uh, the, these Roman senators said, you know, Julius Caesar gave us his power to take, you know, the message and to take Rome to the ends of the earth. I think they were, you know, the, the Romans and the Jews would be aware of that story. It's, you know, within 80 years of when this happened and when it was written, uh, and it, it would be something prominently brought up and displayed uh, in, in that area. 
And Jesus is saying, you know, this is this is what you guys are going to do. The Holy Spirit's going to come. You know, don't don't leave until that happens. But then, you know, my time here is done. But you guys are going to take the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And I think. I think it's maybe a little bit of typical God fashion. That wasn't what they thought coming in. Um, but, you know, Jesus, you know, I think they, they finally got that understanding that it, Jesus rose from the dead, but it still wasn't going to be a military victory, but it was going to be, you know, it was going to be a spiritual victory. Um, you know, you look at this, you know, Acts 1, Matthew 28, it's that, you're going to take this message, you're going to baptize, you know, you're going to make disciples of all nations, you're going to spread this message, and I'm going to be with you the whole time to the, to the very end of the age. I think that's a powerful thing. I think that's the, the ultimate, what do I do next after Resurrection Sunday? Okay, I believe that the tomb was empty. I believe that Jesus raised from the dead. What do I do with that information? This is kind of what, what Jesus told his, his disciples to do. And I think uh, as a young Christian, sometimes trying to do that would be me trying to maybe argue with someone or convince someone of, of the truth of Jesus or of the gospel through, through words and through tying scriptures together and, and showing... And that, that can work. I'm not saying it doesn't ever work. Um, but I think one of, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the way Jesus did it. When you look at the way that Jesus interacted with, with people, you know, he was healing them. He was with them. He was loving them. And he was bringing a, a different uh, radical love that went across the, you know, social norms. He didn't care if you know, he, he touched a woman that was bleeding, or he was, you know, speaking with the woman at the well, or with Samaritans that, and people that wouldn't normally uh, be associated with. And I think, I, I used to make the argument a lot of times about, oh, you know, look at the miracles Jesus did. You know, even in Bible studies that we'll do about Jesus, we'll talk about, you know, miracles and his power over nature. And all those things are true. And there are demonstrations of power. But if you look throughout the Old Testament, there are other people that, who, are, who are not the Messiah, who are not God, that also did miracles. It meant that God was with you, God supported what you were doing, but wasn't necessarily proof that you are, you know, the Son of God, that you, you are the Messiah. Um, but what so many of the, those Old Testament passages that would talk about Jesus did make clear was that you'll be able to tell the Messiah because the Messiah is going to bring the kingdom of God. Uh, one of those passages that I wanted to look at is in Isaiah chapter 32. I'm going to start with verses 1 and 2. <coughs> so Isaiah 32, verses 1 and 2 says, See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each one will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. So there's a king will reign in righteousness. So there's one king. But then it says rulers. There are many rulers. Uh, and I would... I would argue that in, in the kingdom of God, you know, we we are those rulers. You know, First Peter talks about how we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, you know, a people belonging to God. Uh, and in this passage, when it's talking about the kingdoms, it's talking about rulers ruling with justice. It, it describes, it says, each one will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. And I think, you know, that's how Jesus lived while he was on the earth. That's how he set that example. He was, 
a shelter from the, you know, the wind, a refuge from the storm. He still is for us, streams of water in the desert. And he is calling us to be, to be that for other people. That's the way, I think, that we can advance his kingdom to the ends of the earth. It's something that I'm learning from uh, my wife. I think my wife has a great love for people and being there and for people through uh, hard times. And I think being able to do that and be, you know, just to be able to spend time with someone who's lost their mother or, you know, who's got a, you know, addiction to drugs or, or needs, you know, a, a meal or friends that just listen to, <clears throat> you know, to them. That those are, you know, more than a clever argument or a story or a point of the scripture. Sometimes those living and loving in, in that way is the way that we can best uh, advance Jesus' kingdom. Yeah. You know, and, and Acts 2 that we're all familiar with, you know, talks about they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke breads in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere heart praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. But, you know, they, they, were, they were selflessly loving one another, you know, selling their own possessions for the good of those around them. Uh, I want to also look at Acts chapter 5. Opening to this was another passage that I heard Marty Solomon preaching about and making a connection that I would have never made, but that seemed really cool. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 12 of, of Acts 5. And it says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. You know, the, the apostles spent their time you know, with the people. They were, they were using the gift of the Holy Spirit they'd been given to meet the needs of those around them, that people were so, you know, desperate for, for hope that they were just hoping to get a piece of, you know, Peter's shadow, kind of like the, you know, the woman who was bleeding was like, if I just touch Jesus' cloak, I'll be healed. This, this isn't even Jesus, but like, if I just get in his shadow, maybe I'll be healed. Which seems crazy to me. That, that stands out to me like, what? Like, what would make you think that, like, he's a human, like Jesus was God, okay? What would make you think this? And, uh, you know, Marty Solomon linked this back in, in a way that I thought was interesting. If we go back and look at uh, the Isaiah 32 passage that, that I referenced. It was, see, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each one will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. And who was Peter? Peter was the rock. That was what his name stood for. And you know, here it says, and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. And just kind of a cool... Like this is, you know, this scripture about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of righteousness coming to life, you know, in, in the book of Acts and in, in the New Testament. And, and really seeing, proving that, that Jesus is the, the Messiah. You know, he came, he brought the kingdom, the kingdom is here, and this is, this is what happened. And it says, you know, the, the next two verses that I didn't read earlier, says, then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears 
of those who hear will listen. The fearful heart will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent in calm. Sometimes, you know, people may not always be open to, you know, a convincing argument or to, uh, to, the, to the scriptures right off, but when you are, you know, bringing the, the love of Jesus and bringing the, the heart of God uh, and can be a demonstration of that to people, that can help to, you know, open their eyes. It says, then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. But that can soften hearts to allow the, the word to be able to get in there and, and take hold uh, and to grow. And that it's, you know, it's 100% God that does that, not us. But I think trying to, to follow that example of, of love and the way to, you know, advance Jesus' kingdom. That, you know, the, the people there, you know, at the time understood the, the the Caesar reference and the go extend his, his reign that you know in it's just so cool that God takes things like you know Augustus Caesar comes into power he brings something that they call the, the Pax Romana and it's like the age of peace you know shutting down you know marauders and pirates and, and making it you know feel safer for people it also helped to help them expand their empire and be able to have people join them without needing to militarily conquer them. And it helped them to be able to spread to the end of the world, uh, you know, the end of the, the known world at that time. And at the same time, you know, he, he, he was known as the son of God. He was known as the prince of peace. And God goes, at the same time, I'm going to bring you the real son of God. I'm going to bring you the real prince of peace. But I'm going to use what you know, has come through this empire to be able to spread my gospel to the ends of the earth uh, and, and to use, you know, the people that, that he had set apart and that he had taught about the kingdom to be the, the vessel that would deliver. And I think of, you know, Paul is so much the person spreading the gospel at that time. And I think about the heart that he shows, you know, throughout Acts. Like they're talking about, you know, at one point, make sure that you don't forget about the orphans and the widows. He's like, that's the thing I was very eager to, to do. That it's bringing that, uh, that love, the, the way that we can extend Jesus' reign, it is to, it's to follow in those footsteps. I think, you know, Burlington is, is a, small, a small town, but, you know, it, it still has, you know, all these same problems today. There's people that, you know, are are in the, the struggles of addiction. There's people that don't have a place to live. There's people that have, you know, lost friends and family and that they're they're in the desert. They're, you know, they're struggling. They're in, they're in the storm. And God is calling for us to, to help be that shelter, to help be the, the spring in the desert and to be able to share uh, Jesus' love and Jesus' word uh, with others. That's kind of what I, I wanted to take from what do we do with the gospel message, with the resurrection, and the power, uh, and the power that comes from it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.